All right, so now that we've taken a look at some of the uh, history of life on Earth, including formation of the universe, formation of the planet, uh, possible origins for life on Earth, and then talked a little bit about the fossil record and how the fossil record was formed, uh, in this video we're going to take a look at the types of different kinds of evidence that help support the theory of evolution on Earth. Um, and this is all a wide variety of different kinds of things that all kind of point in that same direction, that life seems to have been here, that all of the life that's on the planet could be explained um, pretty much in presence, uh, you know, according to the theory of natural selection, or at least the theory of evolution via natural selection. So let's take a look at some of these different types. So number one is something called structural adaptations. Adaptations are anything in biological sense, any sort of a trait that gives you a survival advantage, something that increases your, um, your evolutionary fitness. So all the pictures on here have something to do with structural adaptations. The key to think about with structural adaptations is that quote that's on the bottom there, that form follows function. In other words, what something does is going to justify or is going to determine what that object can look like. So for example, when you take a look at all those bird beaks over on the left, um, those are all structural adaptations. Different shape of bird beaks work well for different types of food. And so uh, over time, uh, birds have evolved different sorts of um, beak shapes for different types of uh, diets that they're doing, whether it's uh, you know scooping under the water, uh, having a, you know nectar at the bottom of a flower, cracking apart seeds, uh, or uh, tearing flesh, all those different kinds of things. Um, the bee here in the middle uh, is a good example of, of uh, cryptomatic coloring, because that's actually not a bee, it's a wasp. Uh, it's, uh, no, sorry, not a wasp, a moth doesn't even look like it, does it? Um, but it's one creature sort of uh, hiding as another creature. Uh, so it's a type of mimicry, right? Um, you've got the physiological adaptation, structural adaptations here. These are actually leaves. Spines are. They're a very specifically reduced kind of leaf that helps to reduce water loss, and it helps to obviously protect the plant. You've got in this one here, look at those ears, the difference between a hot water, a hot weather uh, jackrabbit here and an arctic hare. Those little tiny ears there versus these big, huge ears is a structural adaptation. Here they act like radiators to let off body heat, and here they're very, very small so that they, you know, rabbit can still hear, but they don't lose a lot of uh, temperature through there. Um, this tapetum lucidum, the little weird thing that gives cats laser eyes, uh, is one of those things that allows uh, cats to see at night. It actually uh, reflects light inside their eyes and makes things uh, brighter than they normally would be. We've got some lovely camouflage over here. There's a nice little lizard. Uh, and then right here we've got another form of mimicry as well, sort of like the, the bee up above, um, that you've got uh, moths that have what almost look like owl eyes um, that absolutely help them uh, sort of impersonate something else. So in all these, these are structural adaptations, evidence that life is uh, adapting or becoming more fit, having to certain structures that help them to survive on Earth um, in their particular environment at the particular time more effectively. Second kinds of adaptations are a little bit harder to see, so students a lot of times have trouble with this one. Physiological adaptations are adaptations on the inside. Um, not that structural adaptations aren't necessarily, but these are more like biochemistry. These have to do with homeostasis. Um, more like body regulation kind of adaptations in some ways. Uh, one of the most classic examples right now in terms of physiological adaptation is the evolution of um, immunity in certain types of bacteria, superbugs, that if we have a very diverse set of uh, bacteria, we treat somebody then with an antibiotic, only the bacteria then that have that antibiotic resistance gene, that trait, will survive. And that's a type of physiological adaptation. Um, over here on the right, we have these things, uh, this little plant here called uh, scurvy grass, which used to be found only at the ocean. This is actually over in uh, England, believe it or not, not in Denmark, but in England. They're now starting to find this plant is spreading along roadways, and they couldn't figure out why, uh, until they realized that what the adaptation is that this scurvy grass has is salt tolerance. That's why it could live near the beach. Well, now it's living near roadways, because they use salt on their roads in the winter just like we do. Um, other examples here, uh, creatures that can live incredibly at the bottom of the ocean at those, at those thermal vents. This is a big, like a geyser, super boiling hot um, water underneath here. And yet there are these lovely little worms all surviving quite happily down there under immense pressure and immense temperature. Temperature that would cook us alive, uh, they thrive in that. Um, thermal regulation in human beings, these are three actually different um, kind of typical profiles of humans. Eskimos, relatively short and wide. Uh, Nilotic are uh, North African herders, incredibly tall and incredibly thin, think basketball player, that kind of body style, uh, and then modern pygmies that live even in uh, rainforests or even down in, say, Australia. Very, very short by height. Um, so average adult will be a little bit taller than the modern Eskimo, somewhere in this range, and a little bit thinner. Uh, but all those are body shapes that help us to regulate um, temperature, and those are physiological uh, adaptations. And then, of course, bioluminescence. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to go in the dark? I love that. I wish I could do that. Uh, but that's another type of adaptation to living in that deep sea. Again, it's an internal, a chemistry kind of thing, but that's another example of a type of adaptation. 
Um, homologous structures are a type of body part. Um, these are a special case that it has to do with evolution, so we got to kind of pay attention to this. Um, if you have a dog or cat at home, this will really help. You can go and kind of feel all their legs and body parts. Uh, but for example, what we see with a homologous structure is that there are bones, you know, like in my hand, that are really similar to the bones of another creature in their hand that's due to a common history. This is due to evolutionary history. There's no reason um, that a human's five fingers would be the same as a cat's five fingers or a bat's or a you know porpoise or a horse. Um, but yet we all have these same bone structures underneath. Uh, if you go home and you take one of your cats, I was going to steal one of mine, but he's sleeping too nicely. Uh, take one of your cats and look at their arm. Their arm, their arm bones, and all those body parts are exactly the same as yours. This is an evidence of homologous structures. Um, the similar body parts, similar bone structures, typically, due to evolutionary history. Uh, you can have this in plants as well. If you take a look at this one up here, all of these are highly modified leaves. That these leaves are still that same embryological structure, but they've evolved to different roles. Like in the pitcher plant, it's a big basket leaf that holds deadly liquid in it. Venus flytraps, they can actually move. Poinsettia, the flowers of a poinsettia are not actually flowers. They're really leaves. The little tiny yellow bit in the very center, that's actually the flowers. And then cactus plants are, are leaves as well. Those are homologous. They have the same underlying structure, but have kind of looked very different on the surface maybe because they're being used for different things. Um, there's another type of structure called analogous structures, and I need to mention this here really quickly. Analogous structures are similar superficially. They're similar because of creatures that have similar um, lifestyles. So for example, different kinds of wings are analogous, not homologous. A bat wing is uh, a hand, a butterfly wing is actually comes off their back, uh, and a bird wing is actually a whole arm. So those aren't the same kinds of structures underneath, but yet they all have a similar kind of big flat shape because being a wing, there's only a few ways to do that. Uh, same thing over here on the right, we have all of our aquatic creatures. Um, we've got an actual fish, we've got a mammal, uh, we have a bird, we have a cartilaginous fish, and another whole different kind of mammal down here. And they all have that same kind of torpedo body shape, um, simply because they're evolving towards a similar lifestyle. They all live in the water, there's similar restraints to that. Um, and this is called convergent evolution, as opposed to homologous a lot of times is divergent evolution. Uh, you're adapting a similar structure for different needs. This is the idea of adapting different structures for similar needs. So these are analogous structures. Again, they're analogies to one another. They're like each other, but they're not the same as each other. So uh, another example of a cool homologous structure is something called a vestigial structure. You guys have a vestigial structure, like your tailbone, I'm sitting on one right now, your appendix, if you've heard of that, down in your guts, or even your wisdom teeth are all vestigial structures. Um, they are leftovers. They used to have a function, but that function is greatly, greatly reduced in us right now. So you used to have a tail. Mammals in general had tails, but in us that tailbone, uh, that tail is so reduced that it's barely gone. Same thing with your wisdom teeth. Some of you never even get them. A lot of you have to get them removed because they're on the way to being vestigial. And here's a couple other examples across the screen here. Uh, you've got uh, on a snake, uh, vestigial thigh bones, those are actually femurs, uh, they're called spikes or spines I think on a snake. Um, you've got dew claws, which are thumb bones on dogs. You've got an actual on a whale, whales have pelvises, they actually have hip bones. You've got vestigial eyes and these lovely little shrews, aren't they adorable? Uh, and then you've got vestigial wings on a kiwi. And then finally, up on a horse bone, uh, if any of you have horses, there's something called a splint. And what a splint is, um, is actually one of the other fingers uh, of a horse. And when a horse walks on its thing, this is the actual hoof of a horse, which is kind of strange to think about that. So a splint is like the actual vestigial remnants of these bones. Um, and again, they still have those bones. They don't really use them, uh, but those are leftovers. Why are they there? Because they're homologous structures. They're due to an evolutionary history. They're still left over, and they're just not quite gone yet. They're on their way, but they're gone enough. So, embryology. Uh, I don't know if you recognize this at all, but uh, this could have been your baby pictures. Uh, at some point in time, you looked suspiciously like a frog. Some of you still look suspiciously like a frog. But anyway, uh, in terms of embryology, we all living things today, even things as simple as fish, any vertebrates, for example, go through a very simber, similar um, embryological development pattern. You know, they go from two cells to four cells to eight cells. But even when they start to develop body parts, we always go through this kind of weird worm looking stage and in this worm looking stage you have these little structures and you can kind of see I'm sort start, of start trying to point to them I'll do it this way point to them up here um, on that side right there those are called pharyngeal arches and pharyngeal arches are actually gills so every one of you at one point in time had gill structures that were forming around your neck now in us 
we lose them really quickly and they go away. But in fishes, those get even more developed and become the true gill structures. But even things like uh, lizards and stuff like that have them relatively late in their development. In us, they become part of your inner ear. It's kind of wild. They're part of your uh, the little three little tiny bones um, that become uh, part of your balance and, and hearing structures. Uh, another good example. Embryologically, uh, embryologically has to do with those uh, splint bones I was telling you about with horses. Um, when horses are still in the womb, they actually have toes. You can see them during early fetal development, and as they develop to their final state, those toes get more and more reduced until eventually they become this very vestigial shape bone like that. It's kind of wild, but you can still see their toes when they're still early in development, and they lose them as they go along. Can you imagine a horse having five toes? It's kind of a weird thought. All right, paleontology, I talked a little bit this, about this in the last video, but paleontology is also one of the huge areas, uh, geology in general, that gives us support in terms of evolution. Uh, we recognize that there are patterns of fossils throughout the planet, that in the oldest uh, layers we've got you know, non-bony types of creatures, uh, even before that single-celled or barely multi-celled, we get into the early kind of shelled sorts of creatures and then into bony creatures, and then to more complex, and then mammals at the very end. We always see the same pattern over and over and over again, no matter where we look. Um, furthermore, when we take a look, we can see beautiful sequences um, in certain cases through time uh, that we can see the development of arms and legs and how these things developed in certain organisms. They didn't pop into place suddenly. Uh, there's development, and here's our, our three-legged horse friends right here. Um, but we can see those things develop, and we can even see right now the confirmation of some of these transitional fossils that uh, we know what we know as birds today um, actually evolved directly from dinosaurs in the past. So here's one of our beautiful, it's called Archaeopteryx. Uh, it's definitely a reptile when you look at its bones and its bone structure and its claws and some of those things. It's definitely a lizard, but it's a lizard with feathers. Um, and those are the, the birds that we have today. So the fossil record, um, looking back in time, we see confirmation of what we would expect to see uh, for the most part over time. Last but not least, and to me this is probably one of the most powerful bits of evidence uh, in terms of support of evolution, is at the chemical level. Um, if we really did evolve on this planet, then we started as chemistry. Uh, and we should see a lot of similarity in terms of our chemistry, and we really, really do. Um, all of the things that are on this are types of, of chemical molecules that are consistent across every single life form on Earth. So things like having a phospholipid bilayer, that's how every cell membrane is formed in every living thing, in every cell on this planet. Um, and I would have the feeling that if, if there was different forms of creation or different forms of life coming here from other planets or something along those lines that there could have been some other version that somehow had been invented. Uh, but complex chemicals, cytochrome C, by the way, is a, a protein that's found in the electron transport chain. Hemoglobin is a protein uh, that carries oxygen in your blood. Remember we talked about protein structure and the, the folding up those alpha helixes? You can see them really clearly in here. Uh, but these are things that are found almost identical. Cytochrome C is almost identical in every creature that has an electron transport chain, which is basically all of us. Hemoglobin in all the mammals and a lot of the higher um, other animals as well have this exact same molecule. ATP, found in every living thing. DNA or RNA, structurally similar in every living thing on the planet. The codon table that you learned how to use in, in one of the last units is the same. So when you've got uh, UCU, that always codes for serine. It doesn't matter whether you're a plant, an animal, a sponge, or a bacterium. That same exact codon table fits. It is universal across life. And here's one of my favorites, too. Biochemical evidence isn't always perfect, either. So, for example, you guys know this. Chlorophyll's green, right? And chlorophyll's job is to absorb light. Well, why isn't chlorophyll black? Because black absorbs more light than green does. Well, it just happens to be that that first chemical, chlorophyll, that, that life happened upon that solved that problem of absorbing light happened to be green. It's not the best, but it works, and life has run with it ever since that chemical has been here. So biochemical evidence, it's, it's incredibly powerful to me uh, that it, this is really what supports um, our ideas of evolution biochemically, that we're all direct, directly related to one another at the atomic level, if not another level above that. So there you go. There's our big ideas from today, um, that there's a lot of different types of evidence that support the theory of evolution. Remember, a theory here is not just a guess. Um, it's supported by lots and lots of different types of observations over many, many years. Um, so we've got this idea of adaptations, both external and internal, structural and physiological adaptations, body parts, uh, homologous structures that are similar, uh, and analogous structures that show evolution to a common function as opposed to from a common background. Um, vestigial structures, things that are being lost. Uh, embryological similarities. Can you imagine that you used to look like a chicken? Well, one of those weird things. The fossil record, and for me especially biochemistry, all strongly support this idea that, that we're putting together that life on Earth has been on Earth 
for a very, very long time, and that we've all come from some sort of a common ancestor in a very, very ancient part of our Earth's history. So if you're interested in looking for a four, you can research some of these other bits of evidence that are out there. There's something called mitochondrial DNA. Uh, you can take a look at amino acid sequences and how they're being used as a sort of an evolutionary clock. Uh, and then you can look at DNA mutation rates themselves and how those are used uh, as an evolutionary clock to take a look at rates of evolution. So there you have it. See you in class tomorrow.